Last time we had talked about oxyfuel cutting, and I mentioned that the speed can be decreased by about 50% if you've got a high carbon content steel, and that produces carbon monoxide, which does not condense, produces a thin boundary layer. Not as thick, it's not, carbon monoxide is not at one atmosphere pressure, um, so it's a thinner boundary layer. When I say not at one atmosphere pressure, it, if it had the same volume as the, as the oxygen coming in, it wouldn't be at one atmosphere pressure um, because most of the oxygen is forming condensed uh, iron oxide liquid. But in any case, either the carbon monoxide or the nitrogen will, uh, will form a small boundary layer and that's going to cut down your, your cutting speed or slow down your cutting speed because you've got to blow that boundary layer away. Um, and then I started talking a little bit about uh, welding of critical structures and we kind of got up to the big inch pipeline in the 1930s and I just started to mention that in World War II um, they started to um, make use of welding in a much bigger way. Uh, in World War I, yeah, they built ships and they did some welding on ships, but they still did a lot of riveting on ships in World War I. And if you go and you look at various bridges around town uh, in some city, you can see, you can almost tell the age, if they are still full of rivets, they were probably built before 1930. Um, and you can't quite tell in the 1930s whether they're riveted or, or welded. Um, but by the time you get to the um, 1940s and 50s, you start seeing much more welding. You look at the central artery and you can't look at it for much longer because they're starting to start tearing it down. You actually see a fair amount of riveting on there, even though it was built in the 50s. Just, you know, they probably still had a bunch of riveters left over from, from uh, old times and knowing good old Boston politics, uh, probably wanted to keep them uh, employed. Um, I mean, there's been a certain amount of corruption in Boston for years. Anybody ever heard the story about the, uh, the Boston Common Parking Garage? You know, you know, you know the Boston Common Park, Parking Garage? You know, right across from the, the Boston Public Garden. There's this flat field where there's no trees. Well, the reason there's no trees there is because they they dug it out, and there's an underground garage several stories uh, deep down there. And uh, when they built it in the 1960s, supposedly the the landfill, which was a million cubic yards of dirt, belonged to the city and was supposed to be taken some some particular place. Um, I guess that way they were still filling in the harbor. And back in those days, um, but it turns out, and, and the city owned it, but the contractor basically, you know, no one knew. I mean, how could no one know what happened, you know, over a several year period of digging this garage? And to this day, no one knows what happened to the million cubic yards of dirt. Only in Boston could you lose a million cubic yards of dirt, okay? I mean, obviously, anybody ought to be able to find it if they wanted to, right? But suppose that I remember as a student, they caught the guy who was uh, um, who had absconded with a million cubic yards of dirt, and actually he absconded with the money because he sold the the fill that belonged to the city. And um, he was in Florida and he had terminal disease, so they didn't prosecute him. But I don't remember if I was a student or young faculty member. But basically, um, you know, only in only in a city like Boston could the corruption run deep enough and wide enough, you know, that that you could lose a million cubic yards of dirt. Um, you would think someone would notice where they put it, you know? But it's probably like one of those World, World War II prison movies where someone would just walk along, you know, they dug a, a tunnel in the prison and they put the dirt in their pockets and kind of, you know, <laughs> dropped it on the ground somewhere, right? So anyway. Um, anyway, after, during World War II, a number of things happened. Um, they started welding the Liberty ships and the Liberty ships and T2 tankers, T2 tankers, yeah. Um, there were over 5,000 ships. At one, at one point, they could actually lay the keel and float the hull within like two weeks from start to finish. Now that's not finished, it actually outfit the, yeah, well, the way you build a ship, you, you build the hull and then you, you don't finish everything inside the ship necessarily, um, you need the, the, the dry dock where you're building the ship to lay down another keel so you float the ship and then you finish outfitting the ship at, uh, while it's floating. But uh, uh, they were building these things uh, and getting them floated within two weeks. 
Um, and someone came up after class and said, asked me if I had heard about the, the fact that during World War II, they were paying people, the welders, by the number of feet of weld that they produced. And in fact, um, she had heard about slugging of the welds. And it's true. It, uh, I've only seen slugged welds once, but they used to take hands of handfuls of electrodes in these thick plates, and they just throw the electrodes in and weld over them. Okay, and I mean you're putting a huge defect in the middle of the weld, but people weren't X-raying it, and they were just supervisors were coming along and measuring how much weld you put in, and you can go a lot faster if you just weld over over a bunch of uh, electrodes in there. I only saw one slug weld in my life, and it turns out it was. Uh, a guy came in with a, a piece of a trailer, and this trailer had been built up in Nova Scotia, and it was carrying, a, it had been built by some farmer up there, and um, it was to take a sailboat, and this was like a 40 or 50 foot sailboat, and the, the person from Nova Scotia who owned the boat had gone down to Newport, Rhode Island, they'd entered one of these big regattas, and he had won first place. And they were coming up, back up uh, Route 28, which is, you know, four-lane divided highway. And the trailer broke, and the brand new sailboat, basically they looked, you know, beside them, they saw this boat passing them on the highway. They heard a, they heard a big pop, and they saw this boat passing them. And that looks just like my boat, you know. It was their boat, and it tipped over and destroyed the whole boat. And so someone brought me this, this connection that had broken, and they wanted to know why it broke. And it turns out, the person who had welded this up had taken a bolt, and they had an intersection of two two steel uh, columns like this, or, or beams like this, and in order to fill the gap, they just put a bolt in there, and they welded over the bolt. Well, that makes a beautiful notch, and you know that was what happened. It fatigued at the notch, and the trailer lasted for one and a half trips from Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, so the person was somewhat disappointed about losing their boat, but anyway. Um, so that's the only time I've seen a slugged weld. Uh, they don't happen very often. People know that they're the wrong thing to do. But uh, some of the liver ships probably went down because of defects like slug, slugged welds. But in addition, um, to give you just a little bit more history, after World War II, because of the liberty ships, and the, these ships would just break in two, and literally just snap in two in the middle of the North Atlantic in winter, and sink, uh, and you'd lose uh, a lot of people and, and, and whatnot. It was, it was uh, they had something like, out of 5,000 ships, it was like 254 major uh, cracks in these things. Not everyone was, was a, a sinking. There's a nice picture, I should bring it, of the USS Schenectady sitting at dry dock, not dry dock, but sitting at dock, and it just split in two, and the, the ship just, turns up this way, the, both ends go, you know, the front end and the back end uh, sink in the water and it's sitting up and you can see this just crack right down the middle of the ship. Um, anyway, because of those fractures, people didn't really understand those fractures, um, but they, they did a big study at three locations after World War II. Um, and starting in 1946, the Naval Research Laboratory in, in uh, Washington, D.C., or outside Washington, across from National Airport, was one of the big places to do the study. And then there was um, a guy, Richard Weck, who was a British uh, welding engineer. And he uh, convinced the British government to found a welding institute just outside of Cambridge, uh, England. And that's now the British Welding Institute. They used to call them, I guess they call themselves the Welding Institute. At one time, they were kind of the world's welding institute until the United States started a welding institute in 1985. Um, and so now they've, they basically are outside the, they, they had a, it's kind of a cartel here of welding institutes. Um, the British have, the British have left uh, the U.S. market to the uh, Edison Welding Institute in, in Columbus, Ohio, and they've left the rest of the world to the British Welding Institute in toward, terms of raising uh, money from companies and, and getting membership and whatnot. And the other place was MIT in the metallurgy department here with Professor Cohen and a few other people. Those were the three places that really studied, did a, a huge amount of work on the subject of brittle fracture of these Liberty ships. And so in the 1950s, early 50s, reports came out and people measured Sharpie toughness. Anybody know what a Sharpie bar is? 
Okay, it's a little one centimeter. Yeah, it's, you have to have a very, very well defined notch, but it's one centimeter square. It's ten centimeters long. It's just a little piece of bar of steel, and you put a two millimeter notch, and the radius of the notch is very precisely defined. And you put this sharpie was a, I think the, the anniversary of, of sharpie's uh, invention of this was a hundred years ago, like one or two years ago. So this was um, about 1900 or so. Um, you pay, basically put the thing in a machine and you hit it with a calibrated hammer. It's basically just a great big pendulum and it just whacks it and um, breaks it at the notch. And you measure how far the pendulum swings up to measure the amount of absorbed energy. Now this is a 1900 test. It's a fairly crude test. It's still widely used as a quality control test. You can't do fracture mechanics based on the information, but you can, you can get the uh, uh, a qualitative number. It turns out they found that of the ships that had major cracks, the plates where the cracks initiated tended to have Sharpie fracture energies of less than 10 foot pounds. Okay, foot pound is an energy measure. So, you know, typically the hammer might be a 120 foot pound hammer, and these things, and a good piece of steel will take 60 to 200 foot pounds to break, but a brittle piece of steel can be down less than 10 foot pounds. So, in any case, um, they found a correlation. Uh, one of the, some of the lowest fracture toughnesses, or not fracture toughnesses, but Sharpie energies they found were around four or five foot pounds. Um, and so they came out in 1950s and they said, well, steels needed to be produced with a fine enough grain size that we can get fracture toughnesses above 10 foot pounds. And then in the 1960s, they kind of said 15 foot pounds. And then in the 1970s, they pushed it up to about 20 foot pounds. And on some of the pipeline projects, they're pushing up towards 40 and 50 foot pounds as the required toughness, uh, or, or it's a measure. They call it the Sharpie toughness, but it's, it's not a fracture fracture toughness. It's a Sharpie toughness. It is a measure of the impact energy, the brittleness, the resistance to brittle fracture. Um, first, it went into uh, requirements for ships, and the Coast Guard maintained it because this came out of the Liberty ships. Then it went into pipelines. It wasn't until about the mid-1990s that people in buildings started to think about fracture toughness. Because everybody said, oh, well, static structure, you don't need toughness because no one's going to hit a building real hard. And then, then we had the Northridge earthquake in, in, in Los Angeles. And those buildings got hit real hard. And a lot of them had brittle fractures. And a lot, I mean, what was it, $10 billion of damage at Northridge or whatever? A lot of it was due to brittle fracture at welds in these two and three inch thick welds. Um, and now the civil engineers have discovered fracture toughness and are putting it into the codes. And they're only about 50 years, uh, 45 years behind the rest of the world in doing that. Um, welds have gone into, since World War II, a lot of critical structures. But it turns out they're still limited in a lot of other critical structures. Aerospace people still don't trust welds. They'd much rather rivet or bolt or forge big pieces or whatever, adhesively bond. Uh, they really don't trust welds. Uh, and um, that's, that's kind of the, the culture of that business. Um, but remember, on the very first day of class, I think I told you something won't fail unless it's been welded, right? So, and that means I got a job as long as things keep failing. I want to start talking about arcs. Remember, we had this heat intensity graph, and it went from a welding at oxyacetylene flames at 1,000 watts per square centimeter up to the next big thing was um, arc welding at 10,000 watts per square centimeter. Well, what is a welding arc? Uh, there, are, there are lots of fancy definitions of arcs. Carl Taylor Compton, who was a president of MIT and a physicist who studied arcs, said, an arc is a discharge in a gas or vapor with a high voltage, well, I'm sorry. An arc is a discharge in a gas or vapor with a voltage drop in the cathode region that is on the order of the lowest ionization potential of the gas or vapor in which it burns. So there. You'll remember that one, right? Um, at least I won't remember it. I have to read it. Um, I like to just say a welding arc is an electrically augmented flame. 
I've got a hot gas in a, an oxyacetylene flame, and I'm limited, even with a jet burner and very high velocities in that 3,000 degree flame, I'm still limited by the boundary layer to no more than about 2,000 watts per square centimeter in a jet burner. You know, in a, in a regular gas flame, oxyacetylene flame, I get about 1,000 watts per square centimeter. I told you yesterday that in a jet burner, you'll get about 2,000 watts per square centimeter. But there is a way to get more energy across that boundary layer. One way to defeat the boundary layer is to shoot electrons through that boundary layer. And we'll talk uh, probably tomorrow uh, about the thickness of the boundary layer in an arc. But basically, an arc has an elect two electrodes. And for welding, one of them is a um, typically a rod or a cyl cylindrical electrode. And you're trying to uh, carry the current between that and a flat plate or something that resembles a flat plate. We will talk um, later in the week about plasma jets, but there is an electromagnetically driven gas jet which blows a 500 meter per second stream of gas from the tip of that electrode, pumping the gas to the surface, and essentially hits the surface. You get a boundary layer, just like the, the flame, but you have even higher velocities in an arc because of this, these electromagnetic forces. It's not. There is some PDV work because the, the arc energy is expanding the gas. The gas out, out here that's being drawn in is cold and it has to expand. It goes up to 10,000 Kelvin. But that's not the really big um, kick. There is an electromagnetic kick as well as the PDV here. It gives you very high velocity jets on the order of 100 to 500 meters per second. They hit the surface. They form a boundary layer across the surface. And they have, the gas has to go somewhere, so it goes off to the sides. That's what gives you the characteristic bell shape of an arc. If you look at an arc, you'll see that it has a bell shape. The plasma plume has a bell shape. That's because the gas is being pushed to the side. And we get to this other stuff. I'll tell you how you can change the bell shape to a football shape. And then basically, you have to stop the convection within the arc. But we'll get to that later. If you plot the voltage going from there to there, so this is, the, if we call this the z direction, it turns out there's a very steep voltage gradient right at the tip of the electrode. And then we get into what we call the plasma column. And then at the other electrode, there's a very steep voltage gradient. And the reason is, the uh, right around here, the gas is cool. Down here in the plasma column, the gas is fairly hot. It'll be on the order of, let's say, 12,000 Kelvin. Up here at the electrode, the electrode is cold. It's only about 3,000 Kelvin. Now, you may or not want to touch something that's 3,000 Kelvin, but you can call that cold in terms of a plasma. In order to carry the current, I have to ionize the gas. And I'll show you in a second. Typically, you've got to get to about five to 10,000 Kelvin in order to strip the electrons off the gas. And so the gas right here at the surface of the electrode is um, is going to be um, um, cooler and doesn't have as many electrons. And in fact, um, since it's cooler and doesn't have as many electrons, its conductivity is not as great. And you basically have to punch through the surface, punch, punch through that boundary layer of cold gas where you don't have extra electrons by shooting the electrons across the surface. Now, the electrons have very high mobility. Uh, their mobility is about 100 times the mobility of the ions because the electrons are light. It turns out you've got a voltage gradient in the plasma column of about 10 volts a centimeter. And uh, 90, if, if the electrons carry are 100 times more mobile than the ions, which are these big heavy atoms, um, then it turns out that 99% of the current is going to be carried by the more mobile electrons in what we call a high pressure arc. What's a high pressure arc? Well, people like Carl Taylor Compton in the 1930s spent a lot of time studying arcs. Um, another guy named uh, Cobine, who was uh, um, a professor up at Harvard and went to run General Electric's research laboratories uh, in the 1950s, um, were busy studying all kinds of arcs in the 1930s. And part of that was because people were really interested as they were going to higher and higher powers in the electrical um, distribution, you know, electrical generation distribution, the utilities, they needed some way to develop circuit breakers. 
Now, you know, we talked before about silver contacts and silver cat oxide contacts for, for switches and stuff. It turns out if you go to like a 50 or 100 amp uh, switch, you use things like silver tungsten composites. And that allows you to, to break the arcs uh, without having the, the arc stay on, or not to break the circuit without getting an arc between the two electrodes. Um, but when you go to 100,000 volt or 300,000 volt, the big high tension lines, and you're carrying thousands of amps through these systems, so you've got megawatts of power, you've got to be able to shut the power off. And you have to have some sort of switch. If you try to do that with metal, just simply breaking metal contacts, you would find that when you, as you try to break the metal contact, the induction in the system, and the induction is just the magnetic stored energy of the current flowing through all the conductors. As those magnetic fields collapse, they keep driving current through it. And so you might pull the, uh, uh, the, the metal contacts apart, but because of the induction in the system, the, uh, um, an arc will, essentially you'll start an arc, and we'll talk about that when we talk about initiating arcs. When you pull two con contact metal surfaces apart, there's a tendency to want to start to ionize the gas in between and start an arc. And if you do that, then you, if you do that and you've got, you know, 300,000 volts and uh, the potential of a million amps behind it, then you're going to melt some things very quickly. And in fact, uh, it's pretty dramatic to see what happens if someone has a fault in a 440 volt system. I mean, you, you may have, most of you have probably seen someone accidentally short out a 110 volt system, right? Anybody seen someone put a screwdriver across 110 volts or something? You don't do that? <laughs> That's sort of fun. Um, if you, as long as your screwdriver is insulated, but you get a big pop, you know, and it's kind of like someone just put a flash bulb off in front of your face, right? And that's because this, you've only got 110 volts, which actually drops due to the power factor a little bit. And you might draw, if it's a fuse for 20 amps, you might draw 100 amps for a fraction of a second before the fuse can react. There's a thermal inertia to the fuse. And so uh, it may, the, you might get a flash for a tenth of a second at 100 amps and 100 volts. So you're talking about, that's 10 kilowatts in a full second, so that's 100 watts or 1,000 watts. Um, and so you can burn things. You can melt the screwdriver if you stick a screwdriver across 110 volts. However, you get up to a 440 volt system. And now your short circuit currents are 50,000 amps and your voltage is 440 volts. And if you short that out, you essentially get an explosion that just melts things within a, within a tenth of a second. I mean, you just big hunks of steel just vaporized, okay? Just boom. I, I calculated one once. It was 25 megawatts of power. It was only a fraction of a second. Now, there's a person standing in front of this, and it was sort of his own fault because he, had store, he, he was pulling his electrician, and he was pulling the fuses out of the box, and he stored the fuses in the box, which you're not supposed to do, and one of them tipped over and shorted out the, the things. I was just looking at one not too long ago where an electrician was taking a screwdriver and he was trying to defeat the interconnect on the box because he wanted to get in there and check, you know, he had to do some repairs in the building and he wanted to check the, uh, um, check to see if he had power in the box. So rather than turning it off and measuring the hot side and where the, and having the, the uh, load side um, dead, which is the way you're supposed to do it, he decided he would save a little time, stick a screwdriver in the slot where the handle is, defeat, the, defeat the, the interlock, the safety interlock on the handle, and that way he would have power to the fuses on the load side, on the line side, and he could check everything at once and he wouldn't have to, to do all this extra work. Except the screwdriver slipped and it started things, and I think in his case, I haven't done the calculation yet, but I think it's about 50 megawatts of power. Um, and basically these people walk away with burns over 50 to 80 percent of their body um, because it's basically like standing for a few milliseconds in front of the sun. I mean right in front of the sun. If you start calculating, their power densities there are 10,000 watts per square centimeter. It's like someone took an arc, the heat intensity of an arc, and just you know, flashed your skin for a tenth of a second. You know, you just, it's, it's bad. Anyway. So arcs, 
have a lot of power. Cobine and Compton and these other people were trying to figure out how to, how to stop the power, turn it off, and they came up with vacuum arcs. And General Electric in the, in the 1950s perfected vacuum arc circuit breakers. Um, vacuum arc circuit breaker might be the size of a desk or even bigger, but it's going to control these 300,000 volt power lines that might have 10,000 amps going through them. Um, and so a lot of the literature on arcs, the scientific literature, is on vacuum arcs and not high pressure arcs. Now what's the difference between a vacuum arc and a high pressure arc? Well, a high pressure in this case is one atmosphere pressure. And the actual definition is of a high pressure arc and a low pressure arc is that if you look at the pressure in, this is in millimeters of mercury, but one atmosphere is 760, somewhere between 10 to the third, 3rd and 10 to the squared, right? This is 760 here. So this is uh, everything here where the temperature of the electrons, the temperature of the ions, and the temperature of the neutral atoms is all relatively equal. In fact, we call that region, um, they, they give it a name, and they call it LTE. So it's this little region right here where they all have this, this is temperature in, in log scale in Kelvin, LTE for local thermodynamic equilibrium. If you go to the physics literature, um, you'll find people debating whether local thermodynamic equilibrium really exists in a high pressure arc, an arc at one atmosphere of pressure, the world we live in. And what they're arguing about is the fact that if the arc is at 12,000 degrees, it may be that the temperature of the ions has an equivalent thermodynamic temperature of 12,000 degrees, but the electrons may be at 12,200. And what they're really arguing is, should I consider that the same temperature or, it's not, or not? I mean, you can prove theoretically that they can't be at the same temperature. What happens when you go to lower pressures is the electrons stay at high temperatures and the ions and gas atoms drop to much lower temperatures. They drop to temperatures that are only a couple hundred degrees, whereas the electron temperature is still 20,000 degrees. Now, why is all that? Well, at lower pressures, you get a separation and you get a dual temperature system where the electrons have a different, significantly different temperature than, than the ions and whatnot. Well, what's happening in the world we live in, a high pressure arc, if, if I have an electron in an electric field and it has a higher mobility than the ion, it's going to be accelerated more rapidly in that field, right? Well, it turns out the velocity is proportional to the temperature. If you go back to the kinetic theory of gases, the more you heat something up, the faster everything travels, right? If things are going faster, they're at a higher temperature. You can define temperature as the, as what is, I can't remember which, whose statistics these are. Is it Bose? It's not Bose-Einstein, it's uh, Planck. Bols no, it's Boltzmann statistics. I think it's, you know, there's different statistics for distributions of energies in, in systems if you go to quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics and stuff. So I think it's a Boltzmann distribution. Um, but anyway, you have a partitioning of energy and you have a distribution of velocities in any statistical system like the gas in this room. And the atoms all have some average velocity, but they actually have a distribution around that. If I apply an electric field to a bunch of charged particles, the ones that have the highest mobility will pick up velocity faster than the ones that are sluggish. Okay? That means that the electrons will pick up electrical energy and get a higher temperature than the ions. Now, it, what happens is in, at one atmosphere pressure where my mean separate particle separation, anybody remember? I calculated it for you once. I told you that the volume of a liquid and the volume of a gas has a ratio of about 500. And I said, what's that mean about the separation distance between molecules in a gas phase? And all you have to do is take the cube root of 500 and get eight. And you find that you have eight, eight molecular distances between atoms in a gas at one atmosphere. Um, you don't remember that, do you? Anyway, um, or if you do remember it, you're, you're, um, you're still thinking about something else. Um, in any case, um, 
with that type of distance of separation and at one atmosphere and standard you know, room temperature, it turns out the electrons, as they're accelerated, don't go but about eight atomic distances before they slam into an atom. If they slam into that atom, they give up some of their energy to that atom. And so they get thermalized by these collisions fairly quickly in a high pressure system because everything's close together. If I start getting to lower pressures, now the electrons can travel a much greater distance before they hit something and even pick up more energy because they're actually accelerating in that field. And so what happens is as you go to lower and lower pressures, you'll start to see these things diverge. As the mean free path between the particles gets large enough, the electrons kind of go their own way and they're not encumbered. There's not enough atoms or ions to get in their way and they just keep on accelerating in that field and uh, pick up a relatively high temperature. On the other hand, the ions, which are sluggish, are not picking up the energy from the collisions with the electrons and they, they end up coming to a lower effective temperature because it's harder for them to be accelerated by the electric field. And so they end up with a much lower temperature. If you go to very, very low pressures, it turns out the ions will start to pick up a higher temperature than the gas, the neutral gas atoms, because they're going to actually start being accelerated. They have a charge, and they will pick up energy if they have a long enough free, mean free path between themselves to uh, not be thermalized against the gas atoms. So you can have a, a three temperature plasma. So here's a one temperature plasma where physicists like to debate whether you really have thermodynamic equilibrium, local thermodynamic equilibrium. And the answer is, of course you don't. They can't be at the same temperature because the very physical process of transferring the energy is the electrons get accelerated in a, in a soup that's essentially everything else is stagnant and they bump into everything else so there's a transfer of energy. And so the electrons have to be a little hotter. Now how much hotter? If you're worried about one or 200 degrees out of 12,000, they're not at their local thermodynamic equilibrium. If that doesn't make any difference to you, they are at local thermodynamic equilibrium. So let's end the debate. It doesn't matter, the physicists still like to argue. Um, so we're interested in high pressure arcs. What is a common plasma present I don't know, must be in this room somewhere. Uh, but pr present, in, well, pr present in the room downstairs where you get breakfast, um, that represents a low pressure arc. Fluorescent lights. Okay? You know, uh, sometimes they call this my fluorescent light lecture. Um, incandescent lights, which we have here, actually, that's fluorescent right there. They re they've replaced that. That's incandescent. So some of these, in fact, you can see the difference in color between them. Uh, yeah, okay. Those are incandescents that just turned on and off. And the others, oops, what am I doing here? Room lights. General lighting. Well, wait a second. Let me look at Pardon me? That's incandescent. And the general room lighting is fluorescent. So these are the fluorescents. Uh oh. Those are the fluorescents. And these others are the incandescents. So we actually have both types in this room. And you can actually see the difference in color if you look at the, uh, the reflection off the aluminum, right? In the fluorescent lights, well, let's, let's go to the incandescents. How, does he, how do you get light out of incandescence? Basically, that's how Edison made his fortune. He took a piece of horse hair and he carbonized it and he put it in inert gas and he made the first light bulb, right? That really worked. Other people had tried things, but they tried all kinds of things and the light bulbs burned out too quickly. Edison went to carbon and he heated it up. If you heat up any solid to a high enough temperature, it will start to glow. And you know things glow when you heat them up because the, uh, uh, if you heat up the, the, the burner on an electric stove, as it gets hot, you see it start to glow red. And the reason for that is that's Planck radiation. And any condensed phase 
where atoms are close together will have vibrations between the atoms. And as those atoms vibrate and you get to higher and higher temperatures, you get higher and higher vibration frequencies, you'll get a Planck radiation curve that as a function of wavelength and intensity looks something like this. The peak temperature here follows a formula of 2898 over the temperature in Kelvin to, oops, yeah, the, I'm sorry, the peak temperature follows that, but the, the wavelength, lambda max, lambda maximum intensity, um, at, for a given temperature follows a formula where this is temperature in Kelvin and this is lambda in microns. Okay, so at 2898, your maximum light intensity is coming off at one micron. Can you see one micron? No. You can't. You can see between about 0.3 and 0.7 microns. So you'd, if you want to get the maximum visible light out of something, you've got to get to temperatures above 2898 Kelvin to get the maximum amount of your intensity. There's going to be some shorter wavelength in here, and you would see things start to glow red well before 2898 Kelvin. Things start to glow red, and then yellow, and then white as the Planck curve shifts with higher temperature to smaller, shorter wavelengths. You'll get more efficiency out of incandescent lights if you get to higher temperatures. So you couldn't make a decent light out of a piece of steel. You can't really make a decent light out of a piece of niobium. You can get it to glow red, but it eventually melts before you get much more than starting to glow red. So he tried, Edison stumbled upon by the Edisonian approach, you know, trying everything. Um, he found that horsehairs, which he heated up slowly, which would carbonize, would make graphite electrodes, and those graphite wires conducted electricity, and he could resistibly heat them, and they would get to temperatures of 3,000, above 3,000 Kelvin, and he could get useful light out of them by Planck radiation. And that's basically just vibrations of the atoms. Now, um, and that's where he, he, uh, he made his fortune. He eventually went to tungsten because tungsten melts at 3300 centigrade, which is 3600 Kelvin, and we actually operate incandescent lights, uh, and they have effective color temperatures. If you're a photographer, you know, and you study photography a lot, and they talk about flash, they'll talk about color temperature. We're basically talking about the effective Planck curve. What's the, what temperature are you at? Are you at a high temperature or are you at a low temperature for your peak temperature? Um, of your flash that's coming off. Well, that's how um, an incandescent light works. The fluorescent lights, and, uh, and obviously an incandescent light, most of the energy going into that is coming off as heat. You put your hand on a 100-watt light bulb and you can burn it, right? Um, and they, they fill those things with about a half an atmosphere of argon gas with the tungsten filaments. Why a half an atmosphere of argon? Why didn't you just make it a vacuum? Well, why, first of all, you do a half an atmosphere because you're going to heat it up. And if you start out at one atmosphere when it's cold and you heat it up, you're going to put stress on the light bulb and then you'll break the light bulb. So you don't want it to be above one atmosphere when you get to, to temperature. Uh, but the reason you actually put gas in there rather than leaving it as a vacuum is because the way the filament degrades is it's vaporizing off part of the metal, part of the tungsten. And you can slow down the rate of vaporization if you have a bunch of atoms that the tungsten atoms bounce into and some of them recondense. Your life of your light bulb goes down significantly as you increase the vacuum because of evaporation, uh, deterioration of the, of the filament, and it goes up, um, uh, or your, and well anyway, the life goes down as your, as your pressure uh, goes down because of evaporation, just leave it at that. Um, now, incandescent's different. Incandescent, it's not, you can put your hand on a fluorescent light and it draws less power. And you know it draws less power because it's not hot. You're not wasting all this energy and heat. And why? Because in the case of a fluorescent light, it's the electrons which are swirling around. They're not just going straight. There's a magnetic field in there and they're actually 
going in spirals. They follow a helix pattern because of the magnetic fields up there. And a fluorescent light is nothing more than a low pressure arc. The electrons have a temperature of 20,000 degrees. Well, 20,000 degrees is plenty hot when they're taking these curved paths to give off electromagnetic radiation. And the electrons are really hot, but the light bulb is cool. The fluorescent light bulb is cool because the ions, which have all the thermal mass, are down around a couple of hundred degrees. And by the time you touch them, uh, the conduction through there and through the glass and everything, you can put your hand around a fluorescent light. Now, there is some loss because these things are at a, a higher temperature. And what's the new great thing that's going to revolutionize lighting right now? How are we going to generate light for rooms in the future? Some of you must have read about this. LEDs. LEDs, right. Um, anybody have any night lights at home that are LEDs? Yeah. OK. You can get these. We can get the little green night lights. Um, that are basically a semiconductor sheet of semiconductor that puts out light. Now, it's not a very, it's sort of like moonlight, which is fine for a night light. And these things go for about a buck a piece, and they're about two inches in diameter. Um, I have them all over my house. Why do I have them all over my house? I guess I put them all over my house when my grandmother lived with, or my, or my mother-in-law lived with us. Um, and she was up all, all times, day and night. I guess also, I originally got them when my son, who's now 13, was a bit younger and needed night lights. But they're still around the house. They take, they take something like a tenth of a watt. And you just plug them into 110 volts and just leave them on all the time. And I got 10 of these, so, you know, around the house, you know, so big deal. I'm burning up a watt, you know. Um, but what's happened is because the semiconductors have gotten better and better, and they can now, put, they start out with red LEDs, and then they got to green, and they got to the getting to make blue. Now they can make blue, they're getting to the point where you can combine these to make a white light. And the advantage of this is the electrons in the semiconductor can have very high effective temperatures, but the silicon atoms in the semiconductor are cold. So I don't have any thermal loss. So it turns out that um, you can significantly improve the lighting efficiency if you're not just wasting it as heat. Incandescent lights are extremely inefficient. You know, 90 percent of the power is going off or more is going off as waste heat. In fluorescent lights, maybe 50 percent of the power is being wasted. In the new LED type of lights, and where you're using them, where they're using them now is your street lights, right? The street lights, the red and green stop lights and go lights are all LEDs. And why are they using LEDs in that application? It's a very high value application. You say, well, it's just before it used to be just an incandescent light. Yeah, but the towns couldn't afford the liability of having one of them burn out. And so on like a monthly basis, they'd have to have in the middle of the night when you're asleep, they have contractors go out there with cherry picker trucks, and they go up there, and they change the light bulb once a month and throw it away, or once every two months, whatever the sequence, whatever the, the, the uh, time is. Because if the light goes out and someone has an accident, you can sue the town if they're just waiting for the lights to go out. But if they're making a regular replacement and a light goes out, well, that's your fault, not theirs. The town can't do any more than replace them on a regular basis, right? But the LEDs basically will last 10, 20, 30 years. So it's not the value of the light bulb anymore. It's the value of the people that are going out. And it probably costs probably 20 or 25 or $50 to change a light bulb on a, on a intersection in the middle of the night. Because you've got to have people out there you know, working uh, uh, at union rates and uh, middle of the night, overtime you know, rates, whatever it is. So there's a tremendous savings by going to the stoplights that are red and white, um, or red and, red and green, um, in terms of the maintenance cost. And so that's why they went into those applications. Even though those, th those things might cost $100, which is more than you want to pay for a light bulb. But now, most of the light bulbs in my house, even the smaller ones that used to be incandescent, are now fluorescent. And they've been doing that, and the price is getting down to two or three bucks for a fluorescent light bulb that I can screw into an incandescent socket, right? 
Uh, eventually, someone's going to have, they're going to have whole walls that are just going to be a light panel that'll just give you soft white light or a ceiling. You can have, you'll be able to light things from anywhere. There are billions of dollars being spent by companies like General Electric and Sylvania and others to essentially take advantage of what's not a plasma technology, but a semiconductor technology where you have electrons at effectively high temperatures in the semiconductor and the semiconductors at even lower temperatures. So there's a little bit about plasma physics and how it fits into light bulbs. If you look at the, um, the voltage of an arc, of an electric arc, versus the current of an arc, it will follow a curve like this as you get to lower and lower currents. It turns out they have, here's the high pressure arc down here at a few tens of volts. And then as you go to lower and lower currents, you cannot generate enough heat to keep the ions thermalized and give you the electrons unless you increase the voltage. You have to have a certain amount of power to strip the electron, to get a high enough temperature in the plasma to strip the electrons. Until you get down to a even lower currents at, at thousands of volts, and with high frequency, you can make a fluorescent light. What they haven't told you here is this might be a DC arc, but this is going to be an AC arc, typically, over here. And the high frequency will keep, will essentially resonate the electrons off, and you get a, what they call a glow discharge. Well, what's a glow discharge? It's a fluorescent light. So you're down here in milliamps of current, but thousands of volts. And so the fluorescent lights actually have to have a big transformer in there that take the 110 volt power and convert it to several thousand volts. Um, and they have to be able to ignite the arc and all these other things. Uh, so they have all kinds of problems with that, but um, that's the, the trick of designing uh, uh, light bulbs. Um, to give you an idea of the thermalization, this will be the last topic for today. Um, thermalization of a plasma, if I look at the particle density versus temperature for a high pressure arc, I have PV is equal to nRT, which is just the, the total number density of all the particles in my gas. As I go to higher temperatures, the gas gets more and more rarefied because, because of PV is equal to nRT. This is what's called the Saha equation, S-A-H-A, -A, after a, a, a physicist from India who first showed how to calculate this for plasmas in the 1920s. Um, but this is for argon, and this is the total number of particles. Uh, there's a line here which shows the number of electrons, Ne. There's a line here which is the argon neutrals. And there's a line here coming up which is the argon ions. And here's the doubly charged argon ions. And here's the triply charged argon ions. As I go out to higher and higher temperatures, I'll strip more and more electrons off. And as the argon decreases, the argon neutrals decrease, the argon atoms increase. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these curves. As you start to generate doubly charged argon ions, the number of, of electrons starts to exceed the number of argon ions, because I'm getting two electrons from some atoms, right, rather than just one. The number of electrons actually follows this curve right here. So this is the thermodynamic equilibrium for a argon plasma. If you look at this, you have to generate enough ions to carry the current in a high pressure arc. And that means you've got to be somewhere in the 10 to 12,000 degree Kelvin range. It turns out you need 5 to 30 percent of your gas ionized to generate enough electrons to carry a 100 amp current. And I'll go over this again tomorrow. But you have to be at a temperature on the order of 10 to 12,000 degrees Kelvin in a high pressure arc in order to generate enough electrons to carry the current. So it turns out that. If you strike an arc, if it, if it can maintain itself, what it's going to do is it will find the lowest possible temperature in which it can generate enough electrons to keep itself going. If it can't generate enough electrons to keep itself going, it'll put itself out. And you'll extinguish the arc. So you've got to have some way in an arc to generate electrons. And we'll talk about that some of that tomorrow.